gracious God, you are indeed holy. You are the sovereign God. As we bow before your sacred presence, thankful for this day, thankful for this time of worship, thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus the Christ. We've gathered in his name. And so we fix ourselves with reverence so that we might adore you and worship you. We make ourselves available for communion with you. Lead us, Holy Spirit, as we sing, as the word is shared, as we are here together. And even as we are nourished, we pray that you will receive the light from our time together. And beyond each of us, we pray, a witness might be extended to those who are on the campus here, on these premises, and that you'll use that witness spirit of God. We bless your name. It's in Christ's name we pray, the one who taught us to stay together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the power. Thank you. you. May be seated. Our prayer response will be read and then we sing. The prayer response is actually the first verse of hymn 35 for the beauty of the earth. It's printed in your bulletins. We're going to say that together. And then we move into singing the song, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Let's say it together. For, for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies. For the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Gracious God, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. Now we're going to do it one more time. Persons are still looking for it in their bulletins or not looking at all. Make sure we all have bulletins. Thank you. It's right under the section that says opening prayer. Prayer responds, hymn 35, for the beauty of the earth, verse 1. Now let's say it together, please. Ready? For? For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Gracious God, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. All things bright and beautiful, So those who are able, can we please stand? And it is also a responsive reading. It is found in our bulletins. Our reading today is taken from Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. And I said before, it is a responsive reading. 
Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. But when Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He has, ris he has been risen from the dead. For Herod himself has sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias. For he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. To the king and asked saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse. Immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison. Brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. We are so thankful for the gift of this day. And we are thankful that we are together. There are a few seats in this area. I am so thankful that neighbors from our community are with us on this uh, Sunday. And members are present. And um, I think Lily is close by, isn't she, uh, Monique? Yes. Lily, uh, Lily relocates um, on Thursday. And we wanted her to be here today. And she wanted to be here. And so she is right there, a few feet away, and we say amen to her presence. Let's give an applause as we welcome uh, each other and Lily to this time of worship. I am truly thankful for all members who are present here and who have come out, and friends who are with us today. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't it a blessing to call this place home? And this is one of hundreds of beaches. May we always be mindful of our blessing, a beautiful life. I'm so thankful that as we go into God's word, as we anticipate the baptism that will happen today and the breaking of bread, sharing in a meal together, that we are very present. We're not passing time. And so I am thankful that each of us, we are, have our hearts open to God's word as we are guided by the theme, A Beautiful Life. Let's have a word of prayer together. Let us pray. Spirit of God, we are thankful that you are present with us. 
and now we draw near to you. We are not passing time during these moments, but we are open for impartation of your word. We honor your presence with our reverence, with our single focus. And now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength, our rock, our redeemer, and the people of God said, Amen. 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 This is Philip Stubbs. I know when I put on my shades, I have a kind of Tensil Washington vibe that starts. <laughs> but uh, this is Philip Stubbs, and it's good to be here and to um, share. Well, maybe I should keep these on. A beautiful life. We all know what beautiful and what ugly stands for. And the gospel reading has some characters. Herod, from the house of Herod. Herodias, his wife, Salome. John the Baptist, and our blessed Savior. And the story has been preserved so that we might receive it. And it might help us to say this is beautiful and this is not beautiful. This fragile life moves so quickly. One day we are in grade six, the next day we are 60 years old. We want to affirm real quickly what a beautiful life is. And that is why the word of God comes to us to help us with that. On yesterday we saw something along with the rest of the world that was ugly. When there was a political rally uh, in the United States, and a 20-year-old arranged to take a rifle to assassinate Donald Trump. And at the end of that experience, he was dead, an attendee was dead, another person, two persons, including uh, Donald Trump, were both wounded. That's ugly, isn't it? That's ugly because that is a violation of the human person. And we know that we are created in the image of God and we are valuable. And we know that that which violates a human person, whether it's a bullet coming out of a rifle or words coming out of someone's mouth, whether it's rudeness or someone being manipulative, we know that that kind of violation is not good. The Bible calls it sin. We need to let that sink in. That's violation. That's the ugly life. Of course, we have been called to live, every one of us, every one of us, the beautiful life. And most, if not all of us, we are on that path already. And this time of sharing is a reminder and a reinforcement of the beautiful life. What the beautiful life is all about. To say no to the ugly life and yes to the beautiful life. In different ways, scripture tells us time and time again, I have set life and death before you. Choose. Choose what you will follow. And there is that invitation more than the invitation. There's the urging that we will choose life. We will choose that which is Beautiful. That young man at 20 is dead. An attendee is dead. Another one is seriously wounded because of choices that have been made, not only by the young man in the States, but that whole culture of violence. And so today, as I share two or three things about the beautiful life, I want us to remember in family life, in church life, in our nation, we make choices about life or death. All of us, about that which is beautiful or that which is ugly. We make choices. That young man made some choices and his life is finished. We make choices and when they accumulate that, those choices for me, for you, create a certain culture in our family, for ourselves, in our church. Now, there are seven things, and 
Of course, I'm not going to go and look exhaustively at the seven things. I want to look at two or three of them today. And the principles, hopefully, will come forth and will be nourishment to you. When I was out here earlier this morning, I prayed that when I spoke, that God would really hide me and that God's word will come to you and you will have some real reinforcement about what the beautiful life is for you and that you'll continue on the path. The last four, I'm not going to talk about them. They are here on this sheet of paper. And the last four has to do with letting go of ugly things, learn how to smile and laugh and dance. And uh, number six, be smart about your money. And number seven, share and serve. I want to speak about the first three that are on the list. As the Spirit of God is present with us, even as the wind is covering this whole space, and may we invite the Spirit of God to cause God's Word to come alive as I speak in these few moments. Here is the first one about the beautiful life. What does the beautiful life look like? First, it's about managing your temple. That's our body. How many bodies do we have? Only one body, eh? Man, you take it for granted until you hit about 40 or 50. And then the check engine light comes on. And you realize, you know something? I got to take care of this thing. So manage your temple well. Paul, in writing, don't miss this, to the Corinthian church says, don't you know, Christians, that your body contains, your temple contains the Holy Spirit? And he goes on to say something else. It's not your own. It belongs to God, so you are to be a steward of your body. God gives us gifts. And so I want to begin saying this to all of us. We are called to manage our temples well. We only have one body. And here is something that happens in the Bahamas. And I am on a path of repentance as far as this is concerned. Hundreds of Bahamians die prematurely every year because they don't manage their temples well. They say things like, I only have a little bit of sugar. And they say it as though sugar is a good thing. You know? Child, the doctor gave me high blood pressure medication, but I know how to manage it. I only take it twice a week. You know? Put some more salt on that. You know? I want a drink. Give me a strong drink. And so, friends, we need to appreciate that there's something about our culture that lulls us into complacency, and life strikes us, and we don't realize we were in an ugly grip all along. Manage your temple well. Do you know your status? My experience with men in particular is that a lot of us who are old school men, and we might be 20 and old school, we brag about the fact that we never go to a doctor. Know your status. Amen? So manage your temple well. That's the way to have a good life uh, so that you can move. I learned recently that our organs are made, hear this, for 120 years. Isn't that incredible? That in the absence of disease and the presence of good health, our organs are made for 120 years. And I've been listening to something. Re listening to some documentaries on the blue zones where people live 10, 15 years more than other persons, Loma Linda and in Greece and in South America and in Africa, in these blue zones, and persons who live 15 years more than the rest of the world's population, they keep moving. They have a relationship circle. Their food is mostly plant-based. Those are the basic things that they do they have a spiritual grounding. The word about life. You want a beautiful life? Manage your temple well. Not long ago, I went on a three-day all-liquid fast. Oh, my goodness. I, that almost killed me. 
And I, I realized how much junk I was eating and drinking. Manage your temple well. You want to have a beautiful life? Manage your temple so that you are 90 and you never sat, sat in a wheelchair. Amen? You can keep moving. You can keep moving. So that's the first thing. Secondly, you want to have a beautiful life? Value your groups. Value your groups. Now, value here is the experience of appreciation. The experience of appreciation. There is, without exception, our psychologists and sociologists tell us that we live best when our primary groups are in good health. They go on to say, loneliness is a killer. Loneliness is a killer. We need to manage our primary relationships well. And of course, you know we're talking about family. And we're talking about friends who are close to us and friends who have become family. How, is, how, are, how are your primary relationships? The family first, ordained by God, and then the church. How is your relationship with the church? Our gospel reading has a family present, oh my goodness, to learn from this family. You had brothers, a brother killing a brother, and then marrying his brothers, that same brother's wife. Herod and Herodias, the whole family had all kinds of things that were beautiful, but they lived an ugly life. Have you ever experienced that? They see someone in the midst of beauty, of jewels, of diamonds, of all of the accru accoutrements of life, and yet they are ugly. As a matter of fact, one of the Herods from this family, listen now, because you see, when we don't become beautiful on the inside, we can touch beautiful things on the outside, and life can still be ugly. One of the Herods was full of beauty externally, and he got up one day, and he went before the people, and he was glistening with beauty. His chauffeur uh, ensemble already brought him to the people, and he stood up, and the people said to him, you look like a god. And Herod said, that's right. And you know the commentary. He was eaten of worms because there's only one God. And beauty is seen, seen in our appreciating the gifts from God and not saying that we are gods ourselves. They had everything beautiful and yet their lives were ugly. And so value your groups. That's an appreciation of your group. Last week we had a group here from North Carolina Community um, uh, College. They called by surprise and said, we're coming on a cruise, we want to stop by. It was their third visit to us. They'd been generous to St. Michael's. They worked in VBS. They made donations in the past. A totally African-American group, Pastor Gloria Watson, and they came and they shared with us, oh, I thank everyone who just worked on the lunch. We had a magnificent time, a magnificent time uh, in the Harold Poitier um, Resource Center. And during the lunchtime, here's what um, Pastor Gloria and one of the students said. Joshua, who is now in seminary, said, I came to your church family, and because I experienced God in your midst, I decided to become a minister. That's wonderful when a church family is beautiful like that. Sometimes we don't know what we're contributing to. And the Spirit of God is doing all kinds of things. By your presence today, you're a part of a witness to everyone who sees us, to each other. I experienced God in your midst. And because of that, I went into seminary. 
This was an African American group in the United Methodist Church, which was primarily Caucasian. They said to us last Thursday at lunch, we are not used to seeing persons who are descendants of Africans as the majority group. And when we saw you all and how you function, it inspired us. That's a beautiful thing about St. Michael's. Let us not let the flesh and Satan cause us to tell, cause us to feel nothing's happening in our midst. There is beauty here. And we want to expand on the beauty, amen? amen. To expand on the beauty. Value your groups. How are you doing with your family life? How are you doing with your friends? who are like family members. You know the summer is a wonderful time for having visits that you don't normally have. Anyone practices that during the summer? I know I do. I know a couple of others have told me they do. This is a wonderful time if your schedule is slowed down to go and visit persons. To say more than just hello, but to say to persons, try to come to talk. And to listen and to talk, and instead of just five minutes, you spend a couple of hours. I have two lunches planned between now and the end of August that I'm looking forward to. It's about managing relationships well. And so the first thing that we want to say is manage your temple and then value your groups. We are wired to be in a group, to manage relationships and family, to manage relationships in the church, and to know that, hey, this is beautiful in church life. And this is ugly. And to know that each one can produce something. Rudeness is ugly. Respect is beautiful. Manipulation is ugly. Fairness and good vulnerability is beautiful. Legalism is ugly. Graciousness is beautiful. Lies are ugly. Truthfulness is beautiful. Pressurizing and manipulating someone, that's ugly. Giving someone a space to say yes or no, that's beautiful. Pushing and pressuring. We're there in the food store. Now I want you to test this out later when we have lunch. Amen? <laughs> when we have lunch today, there should be no rudeness when we have lunch. Amen? Amen. No one should be um, um, uh, cutting their eyes at the, at the wonderful persons who serve. Amen? As a matter of fact, let's be gracious and give them an applause for all the work that they do. Our food persons and our audio persons. No rudeness during lunch. And I'm speaking only to those who are 55 and older. You model it, eh? Are you with me? When you value your group, hear me now. When you value your group, you make an investment in your group. You plan and you make an investment. I was with Mr. and Mrs. Pears a few weeks before their wedding, before they became Mr. and Mrs. Pears, and they still have the glow. And as I was talking with Ricky and Love, I learned, hear me, that without a budget being called, without money being supplied, Ricky went and got a solar operated app apparatus so that when this group comes on the beach, he can have it and things can be fueled for us. Wow. When you value your group, you don't just receive, you share. And lastly, I turn to this page here. The last one, keep spiritually healthy. Let's read that verse together. Ready? If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. Amen. Amen. Keep spiritually healthy. What a gracious moment this is. Here we are in God's creation, and we're able to hear the word of God, and we're able to be reminded that if you're going to have the beautiful life, 
keep spiritually healthy. And it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about being in the word. It's about prayer. It's about allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you. And here's a feature of someone who abides in Jesus. That person is fruitful. They produce spiritual fruit. What is, what does your spiritual fruit look like in terms of your character, in terms of your influence? Hear me now, at home. In terms of your words. Jesus said, if you abide in me, you will produce, what's the word? Much fruit. Much fruit. That means that the person who abides in Jesus comes with some power with them. And they don't have to be bolstered up all the time. You come with some power in you because you are connected with Jesus. And so when you're ushering, you come with that power. When you're working in Sunday school, you come with that power. When you're working in your care group, you come with that power. You don't come and say, oh, I ain't sure. I well, but you, 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 you got something. It's kind of scary to not abide in Jesus and be convinced that you are saved and Jesus is in you and you're going to place your eternity on that. Are you with me? You want to have, uh, is that a hint, Alia? Yeah. <laughs> You want, hear me please, you want to have moments of abiding in Jesus that produces fruitfulness to confirm that you are his. You don't want to say, I know I'm going to glory and you can't show some evidence now. You want evidence of your fruitfulness now. And I want to speak to all of us. When you abide in Jesus and you're growing in maturity, you have some power that grounds you when things are good and convenient and when they are not convenient and not good. So to show up and serve, even when things are trying, it's one of the features of someone who is abiding in Jesus. We're going to have the new church just starting soon. And our church family needs people who are abiding in Jesus. Child, I don't like her, so I ain't showing up. You're 60 and you're a grandmother and that's how you're speaking? And your grandchildren listening to you? Your grandchildren looking and seeing whether you take your tithe and put it in your envelope? And you tell them, pass me the $1 bill? You are the adult and you're watching Netflix and you're in the Bible study. And you wonder how it is that Netflix is forming your family. Friends, there's a cutting element to the word. And I am not standing in political correctness. I'm not just here to please people. I'm here to share the word. True believers abide in Jesus. Now, you know what happens when a preacher talks like this and people aren't prepared to move? They end up going to talk to someone after the benediction and they cut down the service. They cut down the preacher. Stop it. Stop that. Stop it. Welcome the word of God. Even when it's difficult to hear, stop that culture of political correctness. Stop that culture of wanting that which is comfort when growth does not happen. You need to abide in Jesus and become fruitful. The beautiful life. It's about managing your temple well. It's about valuing your group. It's about abiding in Jesus. And there are four more others. I'm not going to get into those, but you can and you'll see the principles. I pray that you will have favor with this word this moment of proclamation, and you'll welcome it into your lives. Sometimes the word comes and there's a rebuke, and that's okay, that's healthy. Amen?
Sometimes the word comes and there's a need for a change or repentance. That is healthy. Let us not be like the persons who have ears that itch to be pleased, but hearts far away from God. Let's bow our heads together for a moment of prayer. That which is ugly is not what God wants us to be about. He wants us to be about that which is beautiful. Well, what has the Spirit of God said to you? Are you abiding in Jesus? Our beautiful God who has brought us together in this beautiful setting with heads bowed, I ask that you lift your heart to God. What do you need to do? Please thank him if you're on that path. Thank him as you think about your own body. Are you, are you managing your temple well? How are you doing with your relationships? With the music ascending and joining this wonderful breeze that we have today. I'm going to offer a prayer. If you're here today and you're not sure about Jesus, friends, I'm not about empty religion. I don't believe you are either. We gather in Jesus' name, and to be a Christian means to have Jesus personally. If you're here and Christ is not your Savior, I'm going to lift up a prayer, and i like all of us to say the prayer with me, but you, if you're not a believer, you say it for yourself. And we're not going to allow this moment to be awkward because this is Jesus' moment. This is Jesus' gathering. And so with heads bowed, I ask that we all say it together because we don't want no one praying alone. Here's the prayer if you want Jesus into your life. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for being the Savior of the world. I embrace you as my personal Savior. And I promise to follow you all of the days of my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's celebrate that moment of confession. We are so thankful for the fullness of this day. We're thankful for the baptism that we will enter into now in a few moments. And we look forward to Lisa Watkins being baptized on this day. We come now to share in our offering, tithes and offering. And we have the basket for the food basket as well, the food basket. So we invite the ushers to come forward. We're going to find a way to put the food basket here. Let's sing together, give thanks with a grateful heart. Is that what you're praying right now? Let's sing together, friends. 